Hello and welcome to Politics Today, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. It's the Friday edition of the program. And as we head into the weekend, let's just bring you up to speed with developments uh, in the polity. Uh, let's tell you that at least 15 persons, sadly, mostly women, have been killed by suspected headsmen in Tilangpat village. That's in Pujan district of Mango local government area of Plateau State. According to the report, 14 female and one male were brutally killed during the attack on Thursday night with houses and property destroyed in that community. The Transition Committee Chairman of Mango, Mr. Marcos Ato, confirmed the incident but could not give exactly the number of figures of to the people that have died. Uh, but local hunters and members of the vigilante group are still combing the bushes, according to reports, to recover the bodies. In the meantime, the Plateau State government has condemned the attack and that on Chikam, a community neighboring Plateau State University in Bokos local government area, where three persons, including a student of the university, was killed. Uh, uh, the commissioner, this speaker, I hope we can get uh, the commissioner's thought explaining the situation uh, that played out on the plateau today. But let's also tell you that there is, uh, away from the plateau story, there's a wave, or a new wave of political defection in Ebonyi State. Uh, some political bigwigs uh, from the People's Democratic Party, the All Progressives Grand Alliance, as well as the Labour Party and other political parties have defected to the All Progressives Congress. The defectors declared unalloyed support to the APC during a political gathering at EBIG, as a north local government area of Ebonyi State. According to the defectors, the people's oriented policies of the APC-led administration in Ebonyi State under the state governor, that's Francis Nguifuru, made them to join the party to support the state government to succeed and make progress. Those were the reasons. But just last week, the People's Democratic Party reiterated that they are focused and committed as a wave of defection continues to hit the party at the state level. So those are some of the things that have been happening as far as the politics is concerned in Ebonyi State. But I hope that at some point in the program, we can get the comment of the Commissioner for Information from Plateau State about this latest killing on the plateau. But those are not the only stories we're tracking for you. There's a lot we're going to deal with today. Okay, basically two things. Let's break it down. Yesterday, NEC had a meeting, People's Democratic Party, the National Executive Committee meeting held. Now, the ripple effect of that meeting is still on, and we're going to talk about it today. Not everybody seemed to agree on what played out yesterday, so we're going to get another perspective on the program. Yesterday, I had a member of the Board of Trustee, uh, Chief Olabode Judge, who uh, was in the program, and he was in those rooms, so part of those decision-making process. And, of course, we're also going to swing gears, so the issues that bothers on the fight against corruption in terms of the anti-graft agency. The latest being the fact that the EFCC has declared, as said yesterday, the former governor of Kogi State wanted over allegations of misappropriation of a fund or money laundering, as they put it, to the tune of over 80 billion naira. These are things that are still in focus. We will explore as much as possible. But I think we have that... Uh, uh, that track from the Commissioner for Information in Plateau State. Okay, let's get to our political roundup story. We'll be right back. The Federal High Court in Abuja has fixed May the 17th to rule on an application by the Federal Inland Revenue Service, FIRS, seeking to serve by substituted means the charge against the top executive of Binance Holdings Limited, Nadim Anjarwala, who fled from custody while awaiting trial. Counsel of FIRS, Moses Idehu, hinted at moves to serve the charge of the fleeing defendant on Tigran Gambarian, the defendant who has been available since the matter started. This comes days after the presiding judge, Justice Emekamwite, had ruled that it was proper to serve on Gambarian, the charge against Binance, which is the first defendant in the case. Still in the Federal High Court, Abuja, where Justice Inyang Eko has dismissed money laundering charges against former Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Adoke, brought by the EFCC. The court found that the EFCC failed to provide evidence establishing the case against Adoke, while noting inconsistencies in the EFCC's claims in different court proceedings. 
The charges stemmed from alleged money laundering of 300 million naira, although the specific transaction of OPL 245 was not part of this case. Justice Echo acquitted Adoke, but ruled that the co defendant, Abubakar Aliyu, must defend himself as he has a case to answer. Governor of Anambra State, Professor Chukuma Suludu, alongside dignitaries, today converged on the International Convention Center to pay tribute to the former governor of the state, Mr. Chukwemeke Zife, who died on December 14th, 2023. The late former governor was elected governor of Anambra State on the platform of the Social Democratic Party and held office from January 2nd, 1992 to 17th of November, 1993. In his tribute, Professor Soludo described the late governor as his personal mentor and a true Nigerian. The Nigerian Bar Association, NBA, says it has invited the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Mrs. Ngozi Okonjewala, to address legal practitioners in the country on how they should assist in rebuilding the nation. The president of the NBA, Yakubu Mekeo, who made a disclosure in Abuja shortly after unveiling the logo and theme of the 2024 Annual General Conference of the Association, says there was need for lawyers to fully appreciate the important role they could play to advance the cause of national development. Pressing forward is a posture that we must all have as a nation for the purpose of rebuilding Nigeria. An advocacy group in Imo State under the aegis of Olu Political Consultative Assembly has warned politicians and political leaders from Imo East Senatorial District, known as Oweri Zone, to stop all forms of political meetings and structures being put together to determine who becomes the next governor of Imo State from Oweri Zone in 2027. Addressing a press conference in Oweri, the Imo State capital, the group described as unfortunate the plans of some politicians in Oweri Zone to disrupt governance under the Ozodim Maled administration with the aim of rooting for governorship seats in the state in 2027. The group described this motive as a distraction to the Uzo Demaled administration, which had just kick-started its second tenure less than three months ago. I did say we're going to talk about the PDP National Executive Committee meeting. But before we get to that conversation... Uh, I did promise that uh, the Commissioner of Information in Plateau State did speak on this issue of the killings. Let's take a listen. Mboko's local government, there's a community very close to the Plateau State University, which is called Chikam, where a pregnant woman was killed and a five-year-old baby was also killed alongside a 200-level computer science student of the Plateau State University. So in the morning, students um, carried the corpse and went around the school in protest. So that um, harvested a lot of emotions. And at the end of the day, there was a lot of protest in that community. And um, it got to a point that um, two students were shot. But we thank God that the situation has been controlled. They were saying they do not want the military in that community. Then, um, lo and behold, assailants trooped in with their guns and they were shooting sporadically where people had to run for their dear lives. As um, some, some hours ago, while well, we spoke to the student union government, to the vice chancellor of the university, and other students and staff of the university, we could even hear gunshots in the background, but the situation is calm now. And um, the one that happened in Mangu local government is another unfortunate act just like the others. These are unprovoked attacks. People just in their sleep, just lose their lives. So we're using this opportunity to call on security agencies. They've done it well, but we're urging them to redou doubly redouble their efforts to do more in the area of arresting and prosecuting the perpetrators of this evil, because we'll be going forth and back if we do not have any arrest after all these um, attacks. So people cannot just come attack and evaporate like the thin air. That is very, very uncalled for. The intelligence gathering must be heightened so that we will not on daily basis or on weekly basis or monthly basis begin to count our, lost, our losses. All right, so that's the latest coming in uh, from the plateau. Unfortunately, uh, sad yet again. Uh, thoughts and our prayers uh, with the families that have been affected in all of this. Uh, but let's now move on to our conversation for the day. The first will be that National Executive Committee meeting of the People's Democratic Party, highly anticipated 
and it has ended yesterday. And there are so many commentaries that have been coming out from that meeting. Some persons are comfortable with the outcome, others are disappointed. So let's find out exactly what is playing out as far as that meeting was concerned. We've been joined in the program by a former governorship aspirant in Ogun State and a PDP chieftain, Mr. Shegun Shomi. He joins us from Abuja Studio. Mr. Shomu, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Let, let's begin with uh, your assessment. Are you satisfied or disappointed with what played out at yesterday's neck? I, I, okay, I think the first thing I want to say is uh, send condolences to the governor and people of Plateau State and to say that we're tired of giving out condolences. We really look forward to a government that can step into the issues, stamp its feet down, and do whatever is required, including rejigging the security architecture to give the states more powers to be able to control the security of their spaces and do a whole lot more. We can't normalize just saying every time people have been killed, people have been killed, people have been killed. Clearly, the APC government from uh, 2015 till date have made a very small problem in the northeastern corner of the country worse. And we'll just hope that Nigerians are taking note of these failed attempts so that when they have another opportunity to pick another leader, they can just dump them. Now, for the neck, I'll say that, you see, people must learn to respect democratic outcomes. We called for this neck. We lobbied for this neck. We bullied for this neck. I sued the party for this neck. Why? because we recognize that in our party, the neck is the sort of the second to the highest. The only one that is higher than it is the national convention. And we haven't had a neck in like 18 months, and there were lots of issues, quarrels about people in discipline, conversation around wiki this, wiki that, and all what you have on the table, especially post-2023 presidential election. And when the conversation was not going away, I thought that maybe if God helped us and we called the neck, all the grab the people that have the opportunity to be at that neck, and our neck is not made up, made up of just anybody. You have the NWC, you have the Senate caucus, about 24 or so of them. You have the Rep caucus, about 16 or so of them. You have um, BOT members. You have all the governors that are you know elected on our stable, about 13 of them. You have all our state chairman, about 36, maybe plus Abuja. You have um, all the presidents and former presidents and vice presidents who are still members of our party. It's a large meeting made up of people that we know also know the party, know its history, know its directive principle, know its operative tendency, some of them even knowing its history. And once we have called that neck, we must then say, how did the neck go? There are three views on the table. There are those who expected the neck to just go in there and slam the people they wanted slammed. And there are those who wanted the Damagun to remain in perpetuity. And there are those who wanted a measured but disciplined way out of the challenge of the now. I seem to fall into that third category. And I am particularly excited that people that Nigerians would think if they met themselves, they would not even say hello to themselves, were all called into one room. First, they did the caucus meeting, they all attended. They did the governor's forum meeting, our governors attended. They did the BOT meeting, our BOT attended. We did our neck, and they went in there. Because of the powers of our neck and the way the neck is structured and the concern of our party, we know that whatever the neck says, will be final until another neck. Now, what has the neck said? I don't know why people are upset. The neck has said, we are giving them a few more months so that the people of the North Central will go and figure out who they're bringing for that replacement. In the meantime, they can continue operating on the things that are now due or are falling due, like Congresses of States and what have you. And the, the, the concern has said, OK, we're going to have the next neck on a certain day. They have even picked a date for the next neck. They've set up a disciplinary committee, and they've set up a reconciliation committee. To the best of information available to me, 
Bukola Saraki, Senate, former Senate President, His, His Excellency Bukola Saraki, is in charge of reconciliation. The former governor of Aqua, the fantastically high performing, not too convoluting, easy going, top level performance governor of Aqua Ibom State, created a new airport, created a new airline, ran business model that makes sense, is going to be in charge of discipline. What does that tell you? First of all, I expect the media to say, run with the headlines that, oh, the PDP is the most organized, most democratic party in Nigeria. Why? Because you can compare us with our rivals. Then I expect that the media to say, bravo, PDP. You dodged the bullet. Your party did not implode. Then I expected the media to say, wow, we are learning how to manage complex situations because of the experience of the PDP and to say that party is made up of matured men. And if anybody else in the media wants to spin it any other way, my response to them is simple. Those who are not members of our party do not have the power to direct how we're going to run our party. And our party is not the national soap opera that people must say they are Mr. Show me if I'm important. Us, you know, getting by, reconciling, and moving on. It, and once Mr. this has happened, I think I expect everybody in Nigeria to say, congratulations, PDP. You have demonstrated again Ma that truly you are the most... Mr. If, if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy you landed. Now, this, this is the point. Uh, nobody wishes anybody bad. Uh, let's be very clear on that. Now, what is going on for people that okay. are perhaps not happy is the fact that because of, quote, unquote, the indiscipline and, quote, unquote, the anti-party activity, of within your political party, your party lost the presidential election. In fact, some people have said, if you were able to put yourself together, Kwan Koso, who got 1 million, Peter Obi, who got 6.1 million, if you added that figure, President Bola Tinubu wouldn't have had a chance to become president. But because of this thing that looks like some level of disagreement in perpetuity, 2015, the PDP lost an election. 2019, the PDP lost an election. And 2023, the PDP lost an election. There was a G5 that was clear on their position. And so people are feeling now that this may endorse the culture of impunity. Doesn't that worry your party? OK, thank you. Thank you that you have gone as far as 2015, when PDP lost. And that you also remembered 2019, when we felt and we truly believe we were cheated. And you remember 2023, where all Nigerians and friends of Nigeria agree that we ran a sham of an election, the justices, no, come on, come on, let's not go there. All I would just say is this. Even when we were all together in 2019, were we able to prevent them from cheating us? And when people decide that they want to leave the party, the culture of the country allows people to freely join and freely leave. We may have assumptions that if everybody had been on board, we would not have been beaten. But we don't know that for sure. These numbers that we are banding, okay, Peter got this, Kwan uh, so got this, they may not be completely, you know, they may be mutually exclusive. There may be numbers there who would not have voted for us if those guys were with us and who voted for them because they were not with us. And so I like to say that election management is the biggest desire we have for the country. We desire that we should be able to have a clean, a credible, a transparent election so that when we finish an election, we don't need to be guessing as to whether we've been done short, the people have been cheated, their suffrage have been taken from them. That is settled. On the issue of discipline, a political party that has our history could not have gone into a neck and scapegoat one or two people. They have set up a disciplinary committee. That disciplinary committee is led by a former governor, a former Senate president, and someone that people think is even a president in waiting. Why don't we just give those people the opportunity to receive memos, to receive petitions, and to consider same, and then decide whether there are no smokes that cause the fire, or are we going to stay there? That's that. The other thing is this. The 2023 election must have an end date. People must not insist that because we had a very unfortunate 2023 that was clearly all over the place, 
that the party does not have the right to say, okay, enough. Now we want to close rank. Now we want to reconcile as much as possible. And in any case, a committee has been set up. For me, I always say, we must always recognize that a political party, in some instance, is a microcosm of the larger society. <laughs> and you compare political parties with political parties. Leave their candidates for now. Are you going to compare PDP with who? Organizations that don't even understand how to run parties, or organizations that you all and I have here, we have never seen anything that remotely resembles what we do. And don't forget that in a political party, it's a constellation of interest, caucuses and all that. You have to clap for our people that they were even able to go through with it with zero act, act nothing or untoward. Would you have preferred a situation where they went to a meeting and they started throwing chairs and behaving like willigans? We have done what we've done. The neck has taken a position. Our constitution is clear, except for the national convention. And the people that went to that neck, with due respect, all of them have to own the decision that they all jointly made. We can't now start saying some people won, some people lost, some people are advantageous, some people are not advantageous. You know why? Because everybody that is due and recognized to come to the neck was there. They may have better information than the media or than me and you. They may have other reasons why they are taking decision. They may be privy to design of the party's future that they are looking at. And I can guarantee you, the PDP has lost top level members before and it didn't die. And if people are too upset and we cannot beg them, we cannot persuade them, we cannot encourage them to take it easy and let's just keep trodding on, believing that onward Christian soldier, they can do whatever they think is good for them. No one has tied them there. If I get fed up, I'll leave. But you, you can't say that a statutory organ that we <clears> all <throat> cried and clamored and begged for will not come and take a decision. It doesn't have to agree with me. Neither does it have to agree with you. That's what is called party discipline. And hello, how many times have the PDP done primaries or congresses? And some people will think they fixed everything and they will get to convention and it will be a different result. Why are we in a hurry when we still have our three years in front of us before we are called upon and called to bring ourselves right, to the people and button. present ourselves? A political party cannot be working only to produce candidates. A political party must be working to deepen democracy, to strengthen its own Mr. institution, if I, if, to obey its own rule and regulation, if, and to if, show people that it's organized. And in if, all of those boxes, PDP ticked it the last couple of days, with the high point being in, the neck. And we proud you know, of there are two, there are two it's parts. So this... It didn't meet all our, our expectations, okay. but we're proud of how far we've come. It's better than where we were yesterday. All right, there are two, par there are two parts to, the, to, to this argument. Now, there's a part of the party members and there's a part of the people who every political party, whether it's the APC, the PDP, or Labour, or whatever party, goes to the election cycle to decide to support. And it is based on the posture or the posturing of that political party that they choose to support that political party in a democracy. So an honest question. Do you think, how do you think Nigerians perceive the PDP right now, given as what played at the election, what happened at NEC, and today? Are they seeing you as PDP as a weak party, indecisive party, or a strong party, honestly? We're not a political party that is going to be led by the nose by people who are not part of our party or do not understand the workings of our party. For a political party to take certain decisions, the constitution gives that power to certain organs. Some of the things that people would like to see, like some strong discipline, like some expulsions and all of that, you can only find them in two places. Either with the NWC as constituent who have the responsibility for day-to-day -day running, or you find them with the neck. The NWC have been managing the party the best they know how to. I'm not saying they're perfect. I could certainly not say they're perfect. And then we pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until we got to the neck. If we get to the neck of our party, it's like saying we're going to the Supreme Court when we went to the Supreme Court. We did not agree with the position of the Supreme Court on the 2023 election, but there has to be an end to litigation. Same way, we may not agree with all of the decisions that has happened. We would have had some expectations that it could have given us something that the people will be happy about. If they want the head of Brutus, they better give us the head of Brutus. 
If they want the stabbing of Caesar, they better stab Caesar and get the people what they want. And if they want the head of John the Baptist, they better <clears> give <throat> the people that. After all, even the people said they wanted Jesus and Pontius Pilate to watch the sound of it. That said, we will have to respect the organ that is empowered to do that. And I have also said to you, they have picked the next date of neck, the next neck, unlike what happened before. In between this neck and the next neck, do you know how many things can happen? The disciplinary committee may have concluded his work. You don't know what they're going to say. We, it's like saying you want to be subjudiced. Let us give the disciplinary committee the opportunity to listen. They are not aliens. They are in this country with us. They read. They hear the papers. They get the opinion of people. But I want to say to the followers across the country, relax. You don't have to fear men more than you fear God. And they may scheme as we are scheming. They may plan as we are planning. But I can assure you, God Almighty, whom we all believe, at least those who profess to follow the books and the prophet, is the best of planners. And on that, I think that Except that the media wants us to say, oh, when we got there, we boxed ourselves. When we got there, we beat ourselves. When we got there, we suspended some people just to entertain them. That's not how a political party is run. Those who are not members of our party must have to respect the decisions that constitute authority when our party has taken, no matter whose ox is God. And I think if you listen to the leadership and you read some of the comments of some of the top leaders, you will notice that, don't worry. We are happy with the decision. We'll live with it. We'll work with it. We'll plan with it. And we'll push for its future. Why? Because PDP is still the most organized democratic political party in this country. We are not a fiefdom of just a few people running a clique culture. Uh, all right, Mr. Show me. The money, they pick the laws they are going to obey. They pick the ones they are not going to obey. Right. They do as they like. Yeah. We don't even know how they... they all right, Mr. Show me. They pass chairman. If I'm a how button. they the new one. The new one is having trouble. Are you guys going to compare PDP with that? Well, that, 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 that's... Uh, Mr. Show me. Uh, Mr. Mr. Show me. Kind of Mr. Shomi, it's not a battle between the media and PDP. You politicians can do what politicians do. Our job is to ask the question, which is what I am doing, based on facts available to us. And that's why, why I'm answering you. Which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, because we've seen, uh, after that election, we've seen defection in, 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 the, in, the, in the... Hold on, sir, hold on. We've seen defection in River State of those members of the House of Assembly. That's one of the points where there are implosions. We've seen impeachments within your party in a Edo State. Uh, a day or the day before the neck, uh, a few days before the neck, G60, led by Ikenga Ogochinere of the House of Reps, said that it's either Damagun goes or they leave. And as I said, today, the post put up being disappointed with the appearance of the FCT minister and the rest in the caucus meeting, he has not taken it down. So would you say this is just an uneasy calm or resolution has been achieved? 30 seconds. I thank you very much for all of those uh, high points you raised. They are valid points, and the anger is valid. The disappointment is legitimate. But the question is that where does the PDP constitution put the authority to look at all of these issues and come up with a decision? It expects that our governors, made up of about 13 of them, are also alive to their responsibility as party men. It expects that our state chairmen are also listening and knowing what is required. It expects that our BOT, made up of retired men, men who have men of timber and caliber who have seen, been there, done that. It expects that our Senate caucus. It expects our rep caucus. It expects our former vice president. We have two of them sitting. And then if those men collectively take a decision, are we now to say that we are smarter than them or more brilliant than them or we have more information than... Nobody bullied anybody. If they had been bullied, we would uh, have started smelling it first from the governor's forum meetings or from the caucus meeting or from the BOT meeting or right. from the neck. And many people say, why did we get come? Why did this, why that? The option is very... The answer is very simple and straightforward. His Excellency Governor used some wicked has made it abundantly clear that he is serving in the APC government as almost the minister of FCT and that he is a member of the PDP. Yes, there's a duplication there because we have our suspicion. Is he loyal to us or is loyal to them? How else is he supposed to prove his loyalty? 
We have never seen him in any APC meeting, but you've seen him in PDP meetings. And you know he's not the type of person that is not brave enough to say, I'm going. Uh, and if uh, you are uh, talking uh, about the policies going on in rivers, I would just say, uh, let me land on this. OK, 30 seconds, 30 rivers. seconds. We're totally My out of time. My position is very clear. Mm -hmm. Governor Wicke cannot tell us that having battered a successor of his liking, he's not going to provide all the wherewithal for that guy to succeed. And President Bolaam Tunumbu has a duty to tell Governor Wike in the firmest term that no, the, go the business of governance is difficult and you know about that. Stop distracting him, but it does not stop him from being a PDP man. We loan him a... to APC, and by the grace of God, at the appropriate time, we take our thing back. Since they Mr. can't find anybody Ash good enough to work in their party. Mr. Ashegu show me. Uh, I must thank you for coming on the program. I'm smiling because we're used to politicians being this optimistic, literally, and showing so much optimism and strength within. But time the will tell. The business of who we, we vote and who we voted for is that of the people. Our yeah, we, business is to market ourselves. We, we, we the wish you are the owner of the sovereign. It doesn't belong we, to politicians. We wish you the very best. We wish your party. We're, go we're going to be here, by the grace of God, to watch how things play out. Show me, Shego Show me is a thank former you. governorship thank aspirant in Ogun State. We must thank you for coming on the program. Thank you. Well, politics. They say it's a game of numbers. Only time will tell. Well, we'll go on this quick break. When we come back, we'll switch gears now and explore that issue around the fight against corruption, positing it with the uh, declaration. Declaring the former governor of Kogi State wanted. I'm talking about Yaya Bello. Join us again after this break. It's been a few days of unfolding drama as far as the issue of the former Kogi State governor is concerned. Yaya Bello now declared wanted by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. And of course, it was arranged yesterday in his absence, and the case has now been shifted to another date. But there was a standoff two days ago as to whether. Uh, he could be arrested or not to be arrested. In fact, it was rumored to have been whisked away by the incumbent governor. There's so many things about this issue. And that's why we're having the senior advocate to make sense of the situation for us. We're joined by senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Deleke Agbola. He joins us via Zoom. Thank you, sir, for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Within the time we have, let's see how much we can get out from this particular conversation. But help us make sense uh, of this judicial standoff that appears to be playing out uh, in this particular Yahya Bello's case? Well, I will not characterize it as a judicial standoff. I will say it's a failure of uh, the security agencies to work in harmony. Because sometimes people forget that there's only one commander in chief for the whole country. So whether you are working for the police, for the army, or the AFCC, you all have one commander-in-chief. So it is really a disgrace when one agency is trying to effect an arrest and another agency or the same government to prevent it. Don't forget, we are all, just our federal institutions, all under the titular command of the president and commander-in-chief of the office of Nigeria. So I will not, the judiciary business is simply to, to prosecute, to to proceed with trial of anybody properly arranged before it. It's not the business of the judiciary to, to bring in, to arrest a particular defendant. So it is what is what is playing out. It's not the first time this thing is happening, but it's a disgrace. And it's something Mr. President must put his feet down so as to stop this, this creation of the judicial process. The reason I call the judicial standoff deliberately is because the premise, perhaps the premise of the action of these law enforcement officers is based on what court document they are trying to obey. On one hand, the state high court has spoken, had given an order concerning his fundamental human right. It's not to be arrested, detained, and all of the, you know, technical statements that were used in that particular order, which... Uh, the part, the, 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 the Kogi State, former Kogi State governor held on to. And then there is the federal high court that has made a pronouncement in terms of an order uh, about the criminal case, which is go there, get him arrested, or whatever it is that is used to explain in the technical term of the law. So don't, that's why I'm calling it a judicial standard. So do you think that they just are not in harmony or they are working based on a judicial document that are available to them? 
Well, my, my take on it is that it's unfortunate that we have these discordant orders coming from different courts. Don't forget, you mentioned the state, Kogi State High Court and the Federal High Court. The issue really is which one comes first between the order made by the Kogi State government, by the Kogi State High Court, and the one made at the federal level. There be that as it may. There is a plethora of judicial authorities that you cannot stop a, 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 an investigative agency like the SEC or the police from investigating crime. And also, I don't see the big deal in somebody coming up before the court. Because if in this in the situation in the country we have law is obeyed and respected, that even if there are two deep conflicting orders, one say arrest, the other one say don't arrest, and the person who wants to arrest come, there is no there is really no reason why a person of the stature of a former governor will not say, okay, let's go there. And then I will explain myself to the court why you cannot arrest me because there is already a proud court order saying I should not be arrested. And our courts, our judges also have to be careful because they should not um, place supine to political uh, manipulations. Why would you why would you say function not be arrested? It's not being taken to Kiri Kiri straight away. It's going to be arraigned before a court of law. And then in that court, it can then say, this is the why I should be allowed to go home. It can apply for bail. It's a billable offense that is being charged. So it is, you may be right about the judicial, uh, judicial quality that is going on, because it should not really happen. And we, the judiciary itself needs to hold this a mirror to its own face to say this is what we are doing to ourselves. So let's let's speak on one of those documents, one of those orders that were obtained by the at the federal high court by the uh, EFCC. To what extent can they go in um, carrying out their operation or ex ex executing an arrest? Uh, because if they are sure that he was inside that building, which there's a strong suspicion he was there, because we understand that the governor of the state, Kogi State, that is his uh, successor, came around, spent five hours there before he left. If there are strong suspicion that is there, and they have a court order in their hand to say, pick this man up, how far, to what extent can they go and it will not be against the law? Do they have a power to break in if they have to break in, just like we saw in the Rochas or Korochas case, or would that be in violation of his fundamental right? Yeah, the, the truth is that there is what I call a balance of terror, because there are also the former governor has his own security details, and which was bolstered by the Areva or the incumbent governor, Governor Redo of Kogi State. So it would have been full added for the for the EFCC to engage in a shooting battle. Of course, they could have done everything possible to ensure that the Yaya Bello is, was arrested, but they also have to balance that one with uh, look at it. What have you got to gain? You can only you can only hide. You can only run, but you cannot hide. It will come to a day that will be arrested. So prudence may have motivated their uh, failure to use maximum force. But they have to be sure that they really have the balance of uh, of terror on their side. So that is unfortunate, and that is where. This is, I mean, this has been happening. It happened in River States. You remember when the judge was to be arrested? Mm. The then of River State, not the not even minister of, uh, of FCT, also refused and brought in policemen to prevent that arrest from being done. Whether right or wrong is immaterial. I'm not sure whether they are, the legality of the arrest is different, but why would one agency prevent another agency from carrying out its duty? We are not talking of a poor person. We are not talking of somebody in the slum. We are talking of a former governor who has the capacity to, re to recruit the best hands in legal profession to defend him. There should be fidelity to the law. Because if everybody decides to, to use what to refuse to surrender to power, then there will be a breakdown of law order. And then there will be anarchy. All right, Lenisik, there's something I want you to speak to, which has to do with public perception of how. Uh, anti-graft agencies are carrying out their operation and how it will affect public perception. As we speak, 
We understand that the immigration has been put him on a watch list. The IGP has withdrawn his security detail. The EFCC had actually said that he was whisked away by his successor. Uh, he was declared wanted. Now, they said he was whisked away. They even said they will not tolerate anybody obstructing their operations. If there need to be an army to be called upon to make sure they do what they have to do, they will have to do. And then they now put out an information. In fact, they said someone with immunity is shielding him from being arrested and arraigned. And they now said he's been declared wanted. Anybody who knows his whereabouts. Does this make sense? Absolutely not. Because it is making a more clear of the system. The, the security around the, even the, the sitting government are policemen. They are DSS people. They are people who are still subject to the overall control of their respective bosses. In the case of the police, the IG, IGP, and in the case of the of DSS, they are directors. So the truth is that if they are really serious about arresting this uh, man, they could do so. It is like um, they are hiding behind one finger. Because the truth is that you can't, there is no way, the, unless this man has left the country, that is the only time it makes sense to declare one thing. But if it's in this country, there are policemen around him, there are, there are state security services around him, he could be arrested if they really have the mind to do so. So we are making a more clear of the system. And for the ordinary man on the streets, we say, oh, this is just party party system. There is no real intent to arrest him. And but I must commend the Attorney General of the Federation and the uh, Minister of Justice for a statement yesterday, which was quite categorical, that there is nobody that is exempt from the power of the <coughs> police or ESCs to investigate and to be arranged. Let them go to court. If I were to advise the former governor, he should go, he should present himself in court and ask to, for, for me to be uh, given out on bail. What do you think, nice let us say, do you think him. he was, do you think he was even invited in the first place and he refused to show up, which is why uh, they had to lay siege on his home? The truth is that the matter, this matter is not, it didn't start yesterday. The matter has been on for some time. I, I understand some, some of these uh, co-actors who have been arraigned before. He could not be arraigned because he, was, he had immunity. The immunity has expired. And we have, had, we have seen governors who are from the opposition walk to the assistant and say, look, I understand you guys are looking for me. I'm here. What do you have for me? They are Nigerians. The people in the assistant are Nigerians. They, 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 they have interacted with them. And they are people, they are not, they are not uh, the devil. And for somebody with the kind of, uh, of influence, money, and power, like the former government, it should be a piece of cake. Because I know for sure, if he goes to court, he will be granted bail, except for this of his recent behavior. But the truth is that the cause itself is not a big matter. Because even with all this, when you see somebody in his behavior so badly, it, when it eventually is taken to court, you will be granted bail on very liberal terms, which is which which also do something to lower the integrity of the judicial system in the eyes of right-thinking members of the public. So everybody must work hand in hand. But the person who can actually make this system to function because he has control of the security agencies is the president he cannot do everything but he must give orders that we have somebody is being is, to, is going to be arrested let him go there and no other agency should shield him and i'm happy that the attorney general of the federation has made that statement All right. that the days where one agency will shield another for you you should you should be over all right, as we begin to wind down, because we've seen two incidents in very quick succession. Nadim and Jawala is on the run. He was in the custody of the National Security Advisor's Office, and he, he, they said he escaped. He escaped, and he's still on the run. Now the FIRS has to serve him very substituted means so that the case can go on. And then this issue of uh, Yaya Bello, former governor of Kogi State. So when people evade arrest or escape custody, is it a proof of guilt? or just fear of possible injustice in the judicial system? What is playing out? Well, the truth is that a lot of people have mortal fear of being arrested, even for a few hours. That is in our mindset, because people believe that the police stations, the prison service, 
are places they should avoid at all costs. So even when you have people, so it's fear that our ah, going to be treated. And um, I don't think that fear is justified, especially for the for the wedding, because for the ordinary person on the street, perhaps if they have reasonable fear, because when the police catch such persons, they, they are most of them are treated very bad. But for somebody who has been a former dog, he will be treated like a king, even in custody. So what, what is the fear of? Maximum within two, three, within a week, this matter will have been sorted out in the court system. So the, we have to encourage our people. In fact, that is why you see a lot of people say, oh, I paid money to be paid out. Because as soon as they are arrested, they want to be released immediately. That is why some policemen take advantage of that to demand for more sum of money from them. If people are ready to say, okay, you can, you have the right to detain me off for, for 24 hours without charging me to court. Then their lawyers will be able to talk after 24 hours. But people do not even want to stay for two hours or three hours. So it speaks to the, the our belief in the prosecution, in the investigative abilities of the police, because you, I'm sure you are familiar with the cartoon of, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a ghost who had to plead guilty of being, of being mm -hmm. a robber. I'm Robert when I was caught by the Nigeria police. So it may be a joke, but for most people, they leave it and they know that they don't want to be involved in oh. any form of arrest. But oh, for a oh, former governor, there is no reason. There is absolutely no reason. On, on, a, on, a, on a final note, uh, uh, my apologies, let's say I understand I have less than a minute to go. Just we, because we've always seen these things happen, uh, people serve in public offices as governors and all of that, and then we, we see FCC go after them with loads of uh, allegations, and this money is in billions of naira of public funds. Should we begin to consider uh, looking at our jurisprudence such that we've done with electoral jurisprudence where there's a time frame to try these things once and for all, six months, three months, or whatever, just like we do with our judicial uh, electoral jurisprudence, so that we stop wasting uh, taxpayers' money? Just 30 well, seconds. Unfortunately, that may not really work, because we are the, the criminal Criminal procedure is quite a lot, is quite different from electoral jurisprudence. The, the, the liberty, life and liberty of the citizens are stake when it comes to the criminal jurisprudence. So it may not be susceptible to being rushed by the electoral uh, system, like uh, the electoral jurisprudence. So, uh, but it could be better. It could be better. When you see what is going uh, on in America now with the trial of uh, uh, Donald Trump, we know that it is possible for people in high places to be held to, be to account. And that is, uh, I, I hope, we their one day. We hope to get there one day. Let us say uh, thank you so much. Uh, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Adeleke Agbola, thank you so much for your insights on this particular issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And that's it on the program uh, for today and for the week. We'll be back again on Sunday for Sunday Politics. Thank you so much for your time and company. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Bye-bye.